Without any further delay, I think we need to do it, don't we, Kim? We need to uh, get to the Culture Blaster. Yeah, it's time. He's waited patiently. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, this guy has a record on movies, on music, on streaming offerings. He is our light in the night. He comes and goes on a rainbow. He is the magnificent Michael Snyder, everybody. The Culture Blaster. Hey, uh, I'm not Bruce Springsteen, but I am voting for uh, Harris and Waltz. Uh, okay. uh, and, uh, wait, Mark, before we go any further, <laughs> any more anecdotes? I just want to get them out of the system <laughs> while I can. Give me an anecdote or two. You know, oh, you know Mark, Mark. I told you he wouldn't be happy. Don't talk to me that way. Yeah, exactly. You know, Mark, um, you know, they say celebrity deaths come in threes. Uh, and so the past few days, uh, I've seen the passing of, of Dame Maggie Smith. Chris Christopherson and Pete Rose, three all-time greats in their respective fields. But what people don't ever talk about is that for many years, they were a thruple. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was very inappropriate. Wow. Love's a mystery, Mark. Um, uh, speaking of mystery, uh, we're in October, one of my favorite months of the year. Halloween's coming up. And uh, in the spirit of fun and frolic, uh, tomorrow night at the Cat Club in San Francisco, uh, Booty Mashup is doing their Disney party. So if you're a, a Disney kid who loves to dance and hang out and want to get into the middle of the uh, the happiest place on earth, that would be Booty at the Cat Club uh, on Folsom in San Francisco. Those are this great shows, those Booty shows for sure. Yeah, Adriana and uh, Jupiter and the rest of the gang are going to be putting on. They'll, they'll be like you know, lip synky things. It, it'll be a lot of fun. But we're really here to do film reviews, and uh, I think we should get going. What do you say? Yes. Also, it's mentioned John Amos died, or Amos died. Yeah, well, there, died. a number of people passed away, but he wasn't in the thruple. Oh, he wasn't. He was, okay, you're sure of that. Well, he, okay. was, he was a zaddy into good times, though. I'll okay. tell you that. That's John <laughs> okay. Amos, a handsome man. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, insofar as this is the 50th anniversary year of NBC's stalwart sketch comedy show, Saturday Night Live, it kind of made sense. The director and um, screenwriter Jason Reitman's engagingly frenetic docudramedy, Saturday Night, is hitting theaters. I mean, Reitman's connection to the long-running series is almost genetic. Um, his father, Ivan Reitman, was the filmmaker responsible for uh, for uh, the SNL adjacent comedy Ghostbusters, bringing it to the screen, a movie that featured two of the earliest uh, SNL cast members, Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray. And true to that legacy, uh, Jason directed and co-wrote Ghostbusters Afterlife, uh, the recent and quite satisfying sequel. And now Jason Reitman, abetted by uh, his Afterlife co-screenwriter Gil Keenan, has delivered Saturday Night, which purports to show in real time the unhinged 90 minutes that preceded the broadcast of the very first episode of what was then simply called Saturday Night, uh, because at that time there was an ABC variety show hosted by Howard Cosell and called Saturday Night Live. And when that tanked, they ended up, uh, you know, grabbing the title and the rest is history. Uh, so at its start in October of 1975, uh, you know, SNL was, you know, let's, let's say green, let's say untested. Um, it featured the no, uh, the not ready for primetime players, um, Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, uh, Chevy Chase, Gilda Radner, Jane Curtin, Lorraine Newman, and Garrett Morris. And the movie uh, is a portrayal of what went down to get this thing on the air, and there were pitfalls, and there were NBC executives that wanted to scotch it. They had um, a, a rerun of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson sitting uh, ready to go in case there was some kind of failure. This was going to be live. Again, you know, uh, there was skepticism there. In any case, um, the movie uh, also features, in addition to a bunch of young actors playing uh, the uh, – not ready for primetime players, the first episode's musical guest, Billy Preston. Uh, you see writers, including Al Franken and Tom Davis. You see the, the show's first guest host, George Carlin, and many, many others. But appropriately, since this is about the conception of SNL, the most prominent person depicted 
is co-creator and showrunner Lorne Michaels, who at the time was a little-known Canadian writer and performer. And um, with uh, NBC employee and eventual network sports maven and interim uh, SNL showrunner Dick Ebersol, he launched the show in front of this host of skeptical executives. Um, I got to say, it is the cast led by Gabriel LaBelle, who, uh, by the way, played Steven Spielberg, uh, well, the role based on Spielberg in The Fablemans, as Michaels here. And this cast is what makes Saturday Night work, even as the kinetic doings on screen come at you uh, fast and furious and feature bits of skits and interactions that, that actually couldn't have and didn't occur during that hour and a half ramp up to the broadcast. I think they're there as Easter eggs and to give a certain sort of sense of verity and what was, you know, beloved and important. Uh, for instance, there's a moment where the actors playing Franken and Davis, who, who are quite good, the guy playing Al Franken looks like a young Al Franken. They, they nailed that. But um, they are with um, Dan Aykroyd, played by Dylan O'Brien, who people may know uh, from TV's Teen Wolf. And they're working out the soon-to-be-famous and fake blood-drenched Julia Child skit that, that wouldn't air until later in the series. So it's all like, look, it's Saturday Night Live, you know? Uh, there are hints of Chevy Chase's eventual departure from the show and so on. That said, O'Brien, uh, Corey Michael Smith as Chase, uh, Ella Hunt as Gilda Radner. There's a moment where the character of Gilda Radner is played by Ella Hunt. Uh, she's wrapping up a little, um, I guess, a little rehearsal. And when they're done, she skips off to another part of the studio. And her physical embodiment of Gilda Radner's joy and um, and kind of kind of youthful verve just nails the character. Um, there's also uh, Emily Fane plays Lorraine Newman. Uh, I guess the best known actor who is portraying one of the players is Lamorne Morris, who just won a um, an Emmy for his work on Fargo and is the guy in the BMO ads. But he's absolutely great as Garrett Morris, no relation. Uh, they do little bits and skits that, that tie into things. You actually get um, the son of Philip Seymour Hoffman, Cooper Hoffman, as Dick Ebersol. And Ebersol was kind of always a, a kind of a, I always had kind of a slimy vibe about him. And um, Letterman used to talk about him being drenched in aftershave and all this other stuff. But that, that, they nailed it. And you also get Willem Dafoe as the main NBC network executive who is hoping for the show to tank and has the Johnny Carson episode poised to go. He's great. Um, unbelievably, Matthew Reese of uh, the Americans and Perry Mason plays George Carlin, unrecognizable. John Batista's Billy Preston and J.K. Simmons as old line TV superstar Milton Burl, who is the antithesis of everything that Saturday Night Live is about. Uh, all of them together make the trip really worthwhile. And again, you know, the, the frenzy is fun. And it's, it's not really what those 90 minutes before airtime were like in terms of what goes on on screen. But I enjoyed it. And, and I had a good time. And uh, there was a show called Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip that Aaron Sorkin did, and he tried to show what it was like backstage at one of these sketch comedy shows. This is way better in terms of dealing with that. It may be shallow, but I dug it. Uh, Saturday night is in theaters. Wow. He really gave it quite the um, quite the hug. Uh, by yeah, the way, you, know, you, you, you used the word abetted, sir, did you? I may yeah, have. At, you used the word purported, did you? Yeah. I may have. And uh, the word verity. Yeah. All right. Entirely possible. Others have been um, noted know, by uh, Tom, I, who is I, the I keeper it. of the day. Yeah. As flawed as it was, I liked it. Uh, speaking of flawed, and maybe I didn't quite like it so much, let's talk briefly about Joker. Folly it opens Adieu. today. Joker, how do you say it? Folly, Folly Adieu? Adieu. Folly okay. Adieu. It, it means um, uh, madness, uh, madness times two, essentially. Okay. And it stars, as you can see, Joaquin Phoenix as um, writer-director Todd Phillips' version of uh, DC Comics' Joker, Batman's arch enemy. Uh, the movie that preceded this, called Joker, starring uh, Joaquin Phoenix as Arthur Fleck, failed stand-up comic um, 
you know, brutalized party clown and eventual murderer uh, was a massive success. Uh, it's kind of like an Elseworlds version of uh, the DC villain and uh, purports to make him sympathetic. And if you saw it, you know that it in large uh, part evokes Martin Scorsese's King of Comedy. Uh, there are aspects of it that really parallel um, King of Comedy, but Joker worked on a number of different levels. This sequel finds Arthur Fleck in jail awaiting trial for the murders he committed, uh, a spoiler alert, on you know television uh, on a, a uh, talk show. And uh, he is in a facility, maybe for the criminally insane, maybe it's just a standard prison, but it is adjacent to an asylum where people aren't necessarily criminals and in a great uh, leap of, of plausibility, in other words, rather implausible, uh, a frenemy guard in his prison, uh, played by the great Brendan Gleeson, brings him to a choir rehearsal in the other facility where he meets Harleen Quinzel, Lee, um, who is basically the Harley Quinn character in this movie. And of course, sparks fly, they fall in love. The movie goes on to you know, show what happens when he finally comes to trial. There's an attempt to uh, see if he's you know, uh, in control of his faculties, if he's fit, if, if, is there a split personality situation? There are song and dance numbers that pop up. It just does not hold together. Um, Lady Gaga as um, Lee Quinzel, the Harley Quinn character, is wonderful. She's got a beautiful singing voice. They sing a lot of standards. Um, Joaquin Phoenix doesn't even try to sing. I mean, he sings, but I don't know if you could call it singing. And throughout, their chemistry may be good, but how things play out is just kind of so haphazard. Um, it, it just doesn't really cohere for some reason. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm rooting for it, even though I'm not a big fan of these like uh, recalibrations and, and you know, I, I guess, like I said, Elseworlds versions of the characters. But the first movie had power, and this thing kind of fritters a little bit of that away. Um, it, Joker, fully a do, yeah, hard to recommend it. I guess, you know, Gaga's great. Let's put it that way. I wish the it had been The performances were good. Uh, is Phoenix is a brilliant actor. Was he good? He, yeah, but he, he isn't given enough to work with that makes any sense. And again, there are all this implausible stuff happens. And I know there are fantasy moments where they're bursting into song, and a few of them are quite stirring and exciting, but it just it, for some reason, it just doesn't work. Uh, by the way, uh, Catherine Keener plays uh, Arthur's psychiatrist. Steve Coogan shows up to interview Arthur Fleck prior to his trial, and Coogan is basically doing Piers Morgan. And I kind of like that little sequence, but uh, ultimately it just didn't work. Uh, for me, I had, I mean, I had quibbles with that, uh, Saturday night, but ultimately I can recommend it. The quibbles in terms of Joker, uh, fully a uh, just a little a bridge too far if you will all right wow it was a much anticipated offering the sequel to the joker but uh michael says just not enough there to uh um let, let's briefly talk about a few more films before please. we uh head into the weekend um hold your breath is sort of a uh western horror movie set in the oklahoma dust bowl in the 1930s where a mother uh, played well played by the great uh, and uh, always impressive actress Sarah Paulson is trying to protect her two daughters. Uh, her husband has gone off to try to earn money. Uh, I don't know, working on the railroad or something. And uh, the the two girls, one of whom is uh, deaf and mute, uh, and mom are barricading against the constant dust storms. And there is kind of a local mythology that there's um, a creature called the gray man who is made out of the dust and can infiltrate your house and, you know, take control of your mind and body. And that is where uh, a lot of the horror lurks. And we try to, uh, you know, fight off those urges. But I guess in the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, when you're uh, basically uh, a mom alone with her daughters and worried about your well-being, you know, uh, things can haunt you. Things can kind of bend your what mind. What was the guy bit. called? The Dust Man? Uh, the Gray Man. Oh, the Gray Man. Okay. Made of, made of dust. Uh, supporting players include the, the great uh, Broadway actress Annalee Ashford, 
uh, who, by the way, was in Masters of Sex and really good in that. She plays like a, a neighboring woman who's also on her own with her kids and her kids are, are having problems. She was Even great Ma- in Kinky Boots, too, I think, on Broadway. Yeah, yeah she's fantastic. Uh, Even Moss Bacharach, cousin on uh, The Bear, plays a, a kind of a roving preacher who shows up who, who may or may not be a villain. Maybe he's channeling the gray man. Maybe the gray man is just, you know, only in mom's mind. Um, it's it's an atmospheric and somewhat effective horror movie. It's not great, but Paulson is so wonderful. Uh, Moss Bacharach is, is great. The kids are good. And there is a, a, a creep factor. This, to me, when it comes to uh, streaming, is probably something you might want to watch on a Saturday night. Uh, again, not great, but it, it, it's okay. And uh, it's streamer on Hulu. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's on Hulu. Yeah, so it's okay. easy to easy to watch. All right. What else do you have? A great culture um, blaster. A much better movie with a fantastic central performance is The Outrun. And I'll just say briefly, Sir Ronan um, plays a young woman uh, who has been living in London. She's living the wildlife. She's hitting the Hackney discos. She's got a boyfriend. And she has a serious drinking problem. I mean, a serious drinking problem. And it renders her absolutely unlikable. Uh, A friend of mine said, "Uh, Saoirse Ronan playing someone unlikable? Oh, yeah. But what's good about this is she goes back to her roots in the Scottish Highlands, uh, out by the the turbulent seas uh, um, that are uh, uh, abutting Scotland. And she tries to kind of clean up her act because things have gone to hell uh, in London for her. And she's she's dealt with childhood family trauma. Her father has issues. Uh, her mom has become very religious. And, you know, this is a farm girl who's now been to the big city and has to rediscover um, kind of a, a, what's good about herself. Uh, it's a healing journey to sobriety thing. And it, it's depicted in a very creative and, and occasionally fractured way uh, by the director, Nora Fingscheidt, uh, who also co-wrote the uh, the movie. And so this woman, fresh out of rehab, goes to this windswept Scottish community, and she decides to actually be a part of a conservation group there. And this personal quest for tranquility and purpose uh, uh, that that comes in the uh, aftermath of the debilita- uh, debilitating um, alcoholism it is rather moving. And what a lovely performance by Sir Ronan. She is one of the great actors of her generation. Uh, This is quite stark and beautiful in terms of the cinematography. And again, it bounces back and forth between her, you know, troubles in London and the things she had to deal with while growing up as a farm girl in this remote area. Uh, I thought it was pretty powerful stuff. Well, it's being compared, the sort of uh, journey to sobriety or the descent into those things that... um are associated with not being sober, being compared to Nick Cage in Leaving Las Vegas. Is the is that at all a comparable depiction, or is that just a well, kind of a... That's all that was being referenced in the chat. To an, to an extent, but not... The fact that she returns to nature and she embraces um, that beautiful... Uh, windswept land and finds herself in isolation and rediscovers a kind of purpose and, um, you know, confronts her addiction. Th- that stuff is, it- it's its own thing. I-, I thought it was lovely, and I thought it wow. was definitely worth seeing. It's uh, called it The in- Outrun, and it's in theaters. It is in theaters. Uh, quickly, I want to mention, you always like to point out that I'm fine with those foreign films, and, oh, I love Quentin Dupieux. He is one of the most interesting, I, he's either French or Belgian, I don't know. I, I'm assuming he's French. He makes, like, crazy, crazy movies, and he has delivered a hilarious comedy called Dali, with a lot of A's, and it's about Salvador Dali, and it's about a young French journalist who's trying to interview him, and Dali is played by a variety of different uh, actors, uh, Edouard Baer, Gilles Lelouch, uh, there's a, an older Dolly, there's a younger Dolly. He's incredibly difficult to deal with. And, uh, you know, uh, Anais de Moustier plays the young uh, journalist, and she's wonderful. And it's very surreal and bizarre and dreamlike, and I just thought it was 
a fresh original and we've seen a few things dealing with salvador dali the great surrealist painter in the past number of years uh this is another one but man i i enjoyed this immensely uh again um uh french with subtitles uh but uh totally rollicking comedy and crazy fully crazy wow that's great so you leave us with a little bit of uh a foreign sophistication, don't you, culture, culture uh, blaster? I, I, I do what I can. Uh, one yeah. quick note for uh, television viewers. Um, the Penguin, which is a spinoff of Matt Reeves' The Batman that starred uh, Robert Pattinson, was a gritty and was a gritty sort of realistic kind of look at, at what it would be like if Batman existed in the real world. Uh, the Penguin was one of the uh, villains in that and kind of depicted as a uh, not as a caricature really but as a, a damaged individual played brilliantly by colin farrell unrecognizably so and this spin-off series on hbo max that's right i called it hbo max all right we'll call it max uh is a tour de force for colin farrell and also playing against type, the wonderful Kristen Milioti as Sophia Falcone, the daughter of uh, Carmine Falcone, the gang boss that dies in the Batman movie, uh, as she tries to maneuver to take over the family business, which, of course, is crime. And, oh, Colin Farrell is great. So it's a gritty crime drama, uh, despite, again, inspired by a, a DC Comics villain and uh, adversary to the Batman, the Penguin. Wow. Isn't that wild? Also, uh uh, it's interesting because I've seen that you know that poster when I'm on uh, HBO Max or whatever they call it now, and it does look intriguing. Colin Farrell, I'll have to check it out based on the Culture Blaster's uh, overwhelming endorsement of it. Uh, I've oh, yeah. seen <laughs> this from a couple of others, Michael. Uh, Phineas is saying, ask the Culture Blaster to quickly mention Tulsa King season, Tulsa King season two, The Penguin, which you just have mentioned. And the old man season two. I guess those uh, are the, favorites. All three of Phineas. The old man. The old man is wonderful, and uh, it, it stars uh, Jeff Bridges, who uh, has grown into such a comfortable character lead. Uh, it, yeah, it's it's a, a treat. We don't have the time to get into great depth. I'll be straight up. I have not watched uh, Sly Stallone in Tulsa King, but people speak highly of it. Yeah, there you go. But here are the other uh, offerings that Michael brought this day. He. Brought the Penguin, as he just mentioned, the Colin Farrell-led project where Colin Farrell plays that Penguin character. He says it's gritty and it's real and it's good. Oh, the, he the, likes uh, it. The, the prosthetic makeup is unbelievable because they don't look like makeup and they don't look like Colin Farrell, but you buy the character. And that's the Penguin. It's on Max. Dolly, the Salvador Dolly story with several different actors playing Dolly through this project. It is French with English subtitles with Quentin Dupieux in the lead role. And no, he's it, the writer. He's writer director. He's the guy, uh, the madman behind this thing. I see. OK, well, I didn't know who he was anyway. So should I know who he is, Quentin Dupieux? Yeah, man, he makes amazing and crazy and surreal films, which I will, I'll give you a list off air. Uh, okay, great stuff. thank you. What? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just a dumb American. So what can I tell you? I just... Uh, you cannot say you love yeah, your country. If it's not featured on NASCAR, I don't know what it is. All right, so The Outrun is the Saoirse Ronan film. She is playing someone unlikable, Michael says, which is amazing because you so want to like this great actress. And you will like this great actress playing the unlikable character in her journey of self-discovery from insobriety to sobriety. And apparently that journey is, in its own way, intoxicating. The uh, Outrun, it's called. The Outrun. It's in theaters now. He really liked it. The other films he reviewed, Hold Your Breath. That is the Sarah Paulson film. It takes place during the Dust Bowl area, and it, it, indeed she's in the Dust Bowl, and she's protecting her two children from the dust storms that are so brutal, and from the legendary Gray Man, who's been spoken of as a supernatural creature that comes to life and can affect life during these various dust storms, it sounds intense. 
Yeah, 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 but he may be for real, and maybe he's only in their minds. Yes, but, yeah. it could be a concoction of their own fearful psychology. Their dusty fears. Hold Your Breath is on Hulu now to be streamed. Joker, Folie à deux. Director Todd Phillips, Bite at the Apple again. The Batman villain. Headed up the first one Joaquin Phoenix did with great effect. It was a very popular film. I think it was uh, acclaimed as such. In this case, the culture blaster is saying Phoenix is great, Gaga is great, but the script just isn't there. He feels there's just not enough to this. And he feels as well that understanding how you have to suspend some belief and maybe in several instances along the way of a film, you might have to suspend some belief several times. This just requires a bit too much of the audience with limited payoff. He really just didn't think that this Joker sequel hit the mark. Is that a fair way to summarize it? You are dead on with that one, Mark. And finally, he started with Saturday Night. This is the telling of the Saturday Night Live story. And it has a number of high-profile people involved in it. But more to the point, Michael really felt as though everyone hit their marks quite well in this project and told the story of Saturday Night Live with a kind of both virtuosity and uh, reality. That is a reflection of reality, that it felt veritous, it felt real, it felt authentic. And he really was impressed with the work that was done to tell this story. Saturday night yeah. will be yeah, in yeah, theaters my, on October 11th, yes? My only my only caveats was their, uh, their need to constantly fold in familiar skits that were from down the road or, or aspects of that to kind of give it the full SNL, if you know what I, I mean. I see, I see. So to kind of remind us that, yeah, there was a comedy with... Uh, um, I was always hoping that you would reference this in your review that that what was it called the the what was it a Sorkin thing or who, I forget who was yeah the... yeah I brought it up the Studio sixty on the Sunset yeah. Strip the, yeah. it, this does what that show tried to do right I mean that's why I said you referenced it yeah I just couldn't remember the name of it but the um, uh, that's great that, that that you feel like this this hit the mark because I thought that did, did miss right. the mark as you said. Uh, What's that, Culture Blaster? Anything else? That and Booty, which is south of Market on um, in San Francisco, if you're there. Yeah, I'm I'm still holding down the fort here in SF. Hope to be back in L.A. by November. Meanwhile, our 49ers go to war against the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, Brock Purdy has finally opened up the eyes of the national uh, sports media and is cutting through their bias about him being the last guy drafted. But, uh, you know, if he makes one misstep, they'll be back saying, oh, he's not really that good. Well, <laughs> let's see what happens on Sunday. Let's put it that way. I'm thinking, Michael, you're in San Francisco. We are coming to San Francisco for the fall show. It's at Fort Mason. And Courtney will be with me. And tickets are a little more than $20, but you get 25% off with the Mark discount, capital M-A-R-K, you go to eventbrite.com, use the discount code Mark, M-A-R-K, and we'll be knocking around there, I think the first day of the San Francisco Fall Show, as it's called. You can read about it at sffallshow.org. Um, I believe the first day is a Thursday, and then it's a week from this coming Thursday, and uh, then we'll be there Friday as well. So I think Thursday we'll really be knocking around there. And I'd like to invite you, Michael. And you know what? Kim is going to buy your ticket for you. And that is really so sweet of her. I, that, so, I can't believe yeah. that. I was going to mm. use the uh, Culture yeah. Blaster discount, but whatever. Yeah. We'll go with Kim. Uh, um, Kim uh, is I, being so generous. Who and, is having that conversation? Uh, Kim is hey, having it. I, I didn't bring it up. I was amazed at her generosity. I, look, I look yeah. forward to any time spent with you and Courtney, so we'll see how that plays out. And in the I'd meantime, yeah. uh, people can check out my articles at thevoicesf.org. The, you know, there's a, a new one up right now. And, and man, uh, I'm looking forward to next Friday on the Mark Thompson Show. I love it. The enthusiasm, the magic, the dreaminess of a man who comes and goes on a rainbow. 
Blaster, Michael Schneider. Thank you, Michael. We love, love you. Everybody. Keep on keeping on, buddy. The Mark Thompson Show.